Welcome again, everyone. The three-part series focuses on traffic management strategies and tactics following the release of the Taming Traffic Report. Today's webinar will focus on off-street and on-street parking management and its vital role in urban traffic reduction. Three presenters from ITDP are joining us today. Dana Yanoka, a senior research associate at the Global Office, who is the main author of the Taming Traffic Report. Dana will also moderate the discussion after the formal presentations. Xiao Kun Liu, Vice Country Director of the ITDP China Office, and Santiago Fernandez Reyes, based in Mexico City, who is the Urban Development and Research Manager at ITDP Mexico. I am very excited to begin this session. I will now hand it off to Dana. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Ivana, and thanks to all of you for joining the webinar today. Um, so we'll go ahead and jump in. So like Ivana mentioned, this is actually the second webinar in our Taming Traffic series. We held the first webinar back in April, and that one focused on road space reallocation interventions as a strategy for traffic reduction. Uh, if you missed that webinar, I highly encourage you to check out the ITDP events page uh, where we have the recording and um, also the slides from that webinar. So today we're focusing on parking reform and then the final webinar in the series will uh, host in a couple of weeks and that one will focus on zone-based vehicle access restrictions, including low emission zones and congestion pricing. So definitely join us again for that last webinar. Um, so before we hear from Santiago and Xiao Kun about their work in Mexico City and Beijing, I'm just going to go ahead and provide um, a little bit of framing for today's discussion based on ITDP's Taming Traffic Report. So we released the Taming Traffic Report in March, and this report really dives deep into a number of different traffic reduction strategies, and we look at some different criteria of these strategies, including capacity needed to implement them. Um, we look at some of the empirical evidence um, in the literature as far as their impacts on um, not only traffic reduction, but other outcomes like um, reducing vehicle kilometers traveled, um, their impact on emissions and air pollution, um, and some other outcomes as well. Um, so the full report is available on the ITDP website. We also have an executive summary, um, and there's also an infographic there as well. So speaking of that infographic, I actually shared this um, on the first webinar, uh, but I, I wanted to go ahead and share it again because I think it does a good job um, kind of differentiating between these three areas of traffic reduction strategies that we uh, dive deeper into in the Tain and Traffic Report. So just to go through this kind of at a high level, um, the, the first kind of area of strategies is what we call road space reallocation. Um, these are typically lower cost, but really high impact strategies. So things like pedestrian priority streets, transit malls, um, complete streets. These are interventions that really focus on people and making walking, cycling, and even taking public transit faster and more convenient compared to driving. Um, road space reallocation is also a really good way to start shifting trips away from driving and towards more sustainable modes. So then the next area is pricing and managing on and off street parking. That's what we're focusing on today. Um, this can really help to continue that momentum away from driving, but parking reform can also um, start to generate revenue that can be used to fund um, improvements to sustainable transport infrastructure, which helps to bring more people um, into uh, sustainable transportation. Um, so parking reform does typically require a bit more capacity and public support. But a good way to build that support is to implement successful road space reallocation projects. So you can really see how these strategies kind of build on one another. And then the final step is starting to think about implementing zones that more directly restrict vehicle access. Um, so this obviously requires the most robust amount of capacity, 
um, and should really only be considered once there are truly enough reliable, affordable alternatives to driving in place. Um, so like I mentioned before, these strategies can be implemented in this kind of step-by-step -step progression, um, but they also really can coexist and kind of build off of and strengthen each other when they're operating together. So today we're talking about parking reform and more specifically uh, three approaches that aim to both reduce demand for parking and also more accurately reflect the true cost of driving. So when we talk about the true cost of driving, we're talking about um, internal costs, which are paid by the individual, but also these external costs which are typically shouldered by society. So things like emissions and other air pollution that contributes to climate change, um, but also things like road uh, fatalities, lost time due to traffic congestion, and even things like the division of community and social fabric as a result of um, expanding car infrastructure. So those three, um, those three approaches for parking that we're gonna focus on are uh, pricing, on-street parking, reforming off-street parking and commercial parking fees. So just to go quickly through these, um, pricing is really a way for cities to better manage demand for vehicles and driving. Um, and you can either do this as a flat rate where there's just one charge, um, one price regardless of uh, the location or the time of day, or you can do demand-based pricing, which is when prices will vary depending on the location of the parking space or the time of day. For off-street parking, um, we're really looking at uh, reducing or eliminating parking minimums uh, and adopting parking maximums. So parking minimums require developers to build a certain amount of parking to serve residential and commercial uses. Parking minimums have been shown to increase housing costs and they also incentivize the use of private vehicles. Whereas parking maximums set an upper limit for parking spaces based on the building's use, parking maximums uh, help to limit parking supply and also increase the price of off-street parking. And this really helps to discourage parking, or excuse me, discourage car trips and also potentially discourage car ownership. And then lastly, commercial parking fees, these should really be, um, considered as sort of an add-on to the first two strategies. Commercial parking fees can be really helpful in raising additional revenue and reducing the number of free or underpriced off-street spaces, but their impact on demand for parking um, and demand for driving really has been inconclusive. And I'll talk about that um, in a couple more slides. So I just wanna go through a couple of quick case studies that we um, touch on in the Taming Traffic Report and also look a bit at uh, what their impacts have actually been on traffic reduction and other um, citywide outcomes. So the first is um, San Francisco. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the demand-based pricing program called SF Park. This was adopted in 2011 um, and was a program that uses sensors to monitor parking space availability. Um, so since it's a demand-based pricing program, that means that the parking prices fluctuate throughout the day. And the goal is to hit um, a target occupancy rate of between 60 and 80%. So the city um, actually conducts these periodic reviews of the program where they look at average occupancy rate by block and adjust um, parking prices based on whether um, those occupancy rates fall in the target range. Um, so the idea behind demand-based pricing is really um, this, this concept that because parking is less expensive at certain times, like um, off-peak hours in the afternoons on weekdays, uh, drivers who can choose when they make their trip are actually incentivized to make those trips during those off-peak times when parking is a little bit cheaper. So in terms of outcomes for the SF Park program, uh, parking availability improved and that led to an 8% reduction in traffic. There were fewer instances of double parking and that led to a 2% increase in public transit speeds. 
greenhouse gas emissions fell by 30%, um, and that was compared to a 6% decrease uh, in control areas. And then finally, uh, net parking revenues increased by about $2 million per year. The second case study is uh, in Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is actually a good example of a city that's reformed both on and off street parking um, sort of in line with each other. So Sao Paulo eliminated its off street parking minimums for all land uses and then adopted parking maximums for residential and commercial buildings that are located along transit corridors. Uh, and then the city also reformed its on street parking in 2016 it replaced uh, a paper coupon system with an automated system that's known as Zona Azul Digital. So the new automated system uh, was really designed to improve parking compliance. This had been a big issue under the paper system uh, where there were a lot of in, uh, instances of fraud and reselling. Um, but the new platform also sort of enables Sao Paulo to think about introducing demand-based pricing um, down the line uh, which wasn't really an option under the paper coupon system. One interesting outcome uh, in Sao Paulo um, due to the elimination of parking minimums was that developers reported being better able to build public housing closer to the city center because they didn't have to factor in the cost of providing parking in their overall development costs. And then uh, the on-street Zona Azul Digital program increased on-street parking revenues by 60% in its first year. And this was largely due to enforcement agents being better able to conduct um, inspections uh, because they could actually um, uh, automatically track parking space occupancy, which wasn't possible under the paper coupon system. And then the last case study here is in Sydney, Australia, um, looking at commercial parking fees. In Sydney, these are actually called parking space levies. Um, a commercial parking fee is one that's applied to commercial parking lots, um, including those that offer free parking. So the fee is typically collected and paid by the lot owner, but it's really ends up being rolled into the parking rates and paid by drivers. So these commercial parking fees, um, the idea is that they increase the cost of parking and that in theory will um, reduce demand for driving, but there have been very few impact evaluations that have been conducted to actually understand the connection between these fees and any reductions in driving. So the real major success of commercial parking fees in practice has been raising revenue. Um, and that revenue is often reallocated to local transport projects, um, like improving public transit facilities. Um, and this has been done in other cities uh, in addition to Sydney, including Melbourne, um, Nottingham in the UK, and also Seattle in the US. So Sydney's commercial parking fee um, raises about 100 million uh, Australian dollars per year. And the revenues have been used to finance transit station upgrades um, and install more secure covered bicycle parking at transit stations and also uh, build out commuter park and ride lots. So that is it for me and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Santiago. Thank you very much, Dana. Um, uh, well, hello everybody. It's very nice to be here. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and as Dana was saying, I'm uh, Santiago Fernandez I'm from Mexico City. And um, I will be talking to you about off-street parking in, 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 in Mexico City, some of the progress and the challenges that we're facing. Perfect. So you should all be seeing my screen. Um, so the presentation that I have, uh, it's, um, I want to cover uh, four main topics, uh, mostly to talk to you about our more city initiatives, you know, which were helping cities uh, with technical support and some communication to reform their off-street parking minimums uh, requirements. The second one is uh, just to go um, a bit, a bit uh, to talk about car control and what the role of off-street parking minimums in that. Finally, just um, flying to Mexico City, I want to talk to you about the norm that was set in 2004 and the analysis that we did and what was the situation around that. 
the reform that we carried out in 2017, of which ITDP Mexico was a part of, of the process. And finally, uh, the results of an ex post evaluation that we did um, on this reform. So our Northeast initiative uh, really started in 2014 with this initial report that we did. And when we started thinking about the impact that off-street parking, excessive off-street parking requirements were actually having in Mexico and in Mexico City. Uh, after that, we used the evidence gathered in that report to do a, a stakeholder engagement strategy that lasted uh, for a couple of years. And luckily in 2017, uh, we were um, able to convince the city government to pass this reform that was pushed uh, by ITVP and other members of, of the civil society. And now this year, 2020 and 2021, we're uh, doing an ex post evaluation of what really happened you know, in that change and really to understand uh, if the change was positive, what was the, the, the size of that impact, um, learning how to continue improving it. So why control cars? Um, I'm sorry to go back to the beginning. I know many of those that are joining are experts on this topic. But just to, just to, just to mention that uh, it's not that we want to control cars. We want to control the negative impacts that cars have on cities. And these negative impacts are usually congestion, uh, but also environmental pollution, the air, noise, uh, road safety impacts, we lose lives, we lose health, and other health uh, issues that arise uh, through pollution and, and just excessive car use and living a very sedentary lifestyle. These impacts are very sizable. So we were thinking about the mobility policy that's actually very efficient and equitable. We need to consider mitigating these impacts and doing something about them. And the problem with cars is that they're not only um, inefficient in the ways they use the road space. Another thing now we're really used to seeing these sorts of diagrams online. I stole this uh, from a social network somewhere. And it shows uh, what's the capacity of a uh, stadium that would be filled if we were filling it with people traveling by each transport mode. And in, in green and in, sorry, in yellow and orange, you can see car and taxi based transportation. And you can see that it's very, very, very inefficient. No, we would be able to fill a very small percentage of the stadium. But that's not only it. Uh, the problem with cars is that they also take excessive land requirements. Why? Because every car trip begins and ends in a parking spot. So that really um, requires that where I'm traveling to and from has a, you know, an, a given space available for me. And as Dana was saying, uh, we have evidence now that um, excessive car use uh, puts us in a situation that it's hard to get out of. No, it's, uh, now we have um, a lot of research about this vicious cycle between the automobile dependency, automobile infrastructure and sprawl. Um, for example, just to go through it a bit, um, we have traffic congestion. Our solution is usually to build more car rented infrastructure such as parking. That induces urban sprawl because it's easier to move to more distant places, and that in turn causes the degradation of the urban core. Perhaps it uh, marginalizes alternate modes that could be more sustainable, that increases self vehicle ownership, increases car use, and then we're back at it again. So, the problem with off street parking is that it really um, catalyzes every stage of this, of this vicious cycle and makes it uh, and reinforces it. Um, how, I'm, well, I'm going to take a step back and just um, trying to really define off-street parking requirements. So everybody's on the same page. Off-street parking requirements are these uh, set levels that are usually specified in building codes or zoning regulations that tell developers or anybody that wants to build something, the amount of parking that should go in it. Um, now we have research that these parking standards are usually not well calibrated. Uh, they began in North American cities and from there they spread to other regions. So usually the numbers that were set were calculated for this, uh, for this context. And they were set uh, to accommodate for moments of maximum demand. Now we usually joke that they were um, commercial centers build parking for Christmas time, but it's only one day a year. No, so the rest of the year, uh, it's, um, it's actually, uh, there's oversupply. And um, the logic behind these uh, street parking regulations that started in, 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 in the US, they spread to Latin America and probably other regions of the world, is that they were treating parking as a mitigator of negative impacts instead of what it really is, which is a generator of those impacts. 
Um, Dana already talked a, bit, a little bit about this. I just wanted to show this slide uh, to show you that there's some sources that we would be willing to share with you if you are interested in this topic. But it's really just to highlight that parking costs. No, it costs uh, us privately. It increases the cost of housing, but it's all, it also costs societies no? in, in, through the negative impacts that I was talking earlier. So jumping into Mexico City, as I mentioned, um, we started this initiative in 2014 with this report that's called Less Parking, More City, in which we analyzed the officer parking situation in Mexico City and we delved into the data of the new constructions between, built between 2009 and 2013. And what we learned first was that we were building a lot of parking, almost 42% of all new buildings, uh, of, of all the land square footage of new buildings was being reported to park. That was the highest single land use that we were using, uh, more than housing that was only, only taking around 32%. So that's already worrying in itself. You know, why are we, why are we building more, more houses for cars than for people? That was not only it, but we also found that it was the highest growing type of land use. This is the graph. Uh, parking is, is the yellow line that you can see. It was really shooting up when we were doing this. When we were doing this study and we, well, it was quickly to see that we were on a sustainable trend. So with this information, uh, we also did some um, studies of, of best practices, try to see what other cities were doing. And we found out these really uh, worrying situations in which, for example, um, just to compare a very famous skyscraper in London, the Shard, which is 72 floors high, uh, if they were only building 47 parking spaces. And in Mexico City, uh, building a skyscraper that's really half the size was building 15,000. No? So that's really an order of magnitude difference that um, really helped us not only to catalyze um, other actors, but also to convince those that weren't really convinced. Because it's just, once that you have the evidence, then you can. Um, engage other stakeholders and really have a more informed conversation. Uh, with that evidence, we also did um, a lot of communication exercises. Uh, we uh, engaged the Ped Academy. We, did, we even did a host of a design competition to get students to think about what would they do with that space. And that really helped us build momentum, as this, as this <laughs> webinar is called. Uh, build momentum, also build consensus that it was something that needed to be done and that needed to be addressed. And as I was mentioning earlier, um, in 2017, in mid-year, the mayor of Mexico City announced that uh, parking regulations were being uh, reformed. Um, and what happened in this, in this reform of 2017? Three main things happened. The first one is that minimum parking requirements were eliminated, you know, and they were recognized as a reason behind all this excess parking that we were, build that we were building. So we slashed these parking minimums, except for bicycle parking. That's also need to be mentioned that, were, uh, that they were established and also raised. Um, the minimum parking requirements were, were then replaced with maximum levels of allowable parking. You know, that's a complete shift in paradigm. Um, and the levels were usually set at the old minimum. And the third change was that a charging system was put in place. As Dana was saying also, pricing is a good strategy. We we're trying to, to match uh, demand. Uh, after when a developer approached 50% of the allowable parking maximum, they were um, they had to pay. Now they have to pay a fee. The fee is set on two zones. Uh, we split the city in zone one, which is the more centric area that's very well served by transit, and zone two, which is uh, a bit more on the periphery. And only zone one has this charge. Uh, so we were trying to recognize that maybe the conditions are not the same in the city. But also this, uh, this reform is set to be revised every three years. No? So we were recognizing that even if it wasn't perfect at that time, it was an advancement. And now we're in the, at the third year in which we are looking back and, and to what happened. So last year we went back, uh, we went back to the city and we requested the, the data for the new constructions that were built with this new parking reform just to evaluate what was happening. Uh, we also uh, com complemented this data analysis with service and interviews with stakeholders, developers, government officials. And uh, we also did an exercise to estimate what could be the long-term impacts uh, in greenhouse gas emissions avoided thanks to policies like this. This is uh, how the two norms would compare. Um, in, the, in red, you see the minimums that were required in 2004, and in blue, the new maximums that are permitted under the 2017 norm. 
And this is only for housing, but just to show that um, the final print, once that we went back and look at the actual reform and how it was being applied, um, some uses, especially this is housing, were allowed to build um, parking amounts that were still excessive, that are still excessive. Um, another example, for example, restaurants, which is the first one that you see here, is where we see a very positive change. We changed um, a hypothetical 1,000 meter square meter restaurant, for example, would have had built have, would have had to build 100 parking spaces. Now it's only around 30. But other uses such as parking spaces, which you can see, um, it's the fourth the fourth set of columns. Sorry, the fifth set of columns in the middle. They, are, they were actually raised, you no? Know? So we were think we, we, we realized that um, maybe um, there was still some room, there is still some room for improvement. But the main impact that we found that was actually when we were looking at the data, developers were actually building a lot less parking compared to the situation in 2004 when they were building 42 percent of new uh, uh, of new buildings uh, were devoted to parking. Now only around 33 percent. You know that's a very big it's a very big change, it's a tangible change. And through the interviews, we also found that uh, developers and other stakeholders were very aware of this change and they saw it as a very positive, as a very positive thing. In, uh, we use this result to try to estimate what could be the long-term impacts of the trips avoided by avoiding, by eliminating parking. Um, we, we use some parameters to estimate how many uh, parking trips could, could have been avoided per parking space. And we realized that in the long term, they could amount to a sizable reduction in CO2 and, and other greenhouse gas emissions reductions, um, close to 650,000 tons of CO2. Um, but we also found out that to really achieve uh, net zero growth, which should be our, our objective, we will, we will need to have a more aggressive strategy in terms of revising these parking regulations downwards uh, every three years at least. And also thinking about what other strategies we could use to repurpose existing parking. The main findings of this report are that uh, the 2017 parking reform appears to have had a very tangible impact in allowing new constructions uh, of new developments with this parking. As I mentioned, we also found that maximum levels might be still set uh, too high, especially for some uses, and we need to revise that. And through the interview, we also found out that these developer contributions, this charge that was directed towards a mobility and road safety fund to fund uh, sustainable mobility initiatives are still opaque. And there's a need for transparency. You know? So we, 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 need, we need to go back and look into that and how to improve it. Most stakeholders view the changes favorably. Developers, for example, they argued that they were now able to build um, housing at less cost. Um, City governments, they also recognize that thanks to this change, they are now able to negotiate with developers additional parking reductions. And in the city core, they, they did um, a negotiation with all the main developers and they found that they were, uh, they were able to build at least 50% less than what they should have built uh, under the previous regulations. So what are our next steps? Um, the, we are, um, taking this evidence and really trying to engage more cities. And if you are listening and wherever you live, maybe this is something that could interest you. Now we have resources and this is something that you should also try to consider. We will be working in Mexico City on the things that we learned, uh, updating the office parking norms, perhaps uh, working with parking to housing. Morelia, which is a medium-sized city in Mexico, will also be eliminating these parking requirements um, very, uh, very soon. They are already in discussions and it's supposed to pass. Um, hopefully this week or the next. Uh, San Pedro Garza Garcia in Monterrey, which is the most uh, auto-oriented municipality in Mexico and Latin America, they will also be publishing updated municipal building codes to eliminate parking. And Guadalajara, um, also hopefully some cities in South America, such as Argentina. So just to conclude, I think that every city needs to revise their off parking regulations because they have a very big, big impact in how we're building and planning our cities. Um, especially uh, try to think about whether these, uh, these regulations are pertinent still to your cities. We now have evidence for Mexico City that they actually contribute to the reduction in those space devoted to parking. So um, this evidence is helpful because now we're able to, to convince other cities, but we still need to 
generate evidence in our context. But more generally, um, just invite you all as you are joining this webinar into thinking what else can we do with that space devoted to park? Uh, there's so many things that we could do to build more city and less parking. So I, I invite you to keep thinking about that. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. And now I pass the torch to Shokun. Uh Thanks. I'll just interject real quick uh, as a reminder. Um, there's an interpretation um, option for the non-Chinese speaking audience. Just simply click the globe in the in the lower bar and then choose English um, English audio channel. Thank you so much. And Xiao Kun, you can unmute yourself. Are you able to unmute yourself, Shokun? Uh, yes, yes, in the slide. Great. It's uh, Ms. Liu Shaokun from ITDB China office. Now we are going to talk about uh, Beijing parking reform. IDB China worked with an um, Asian Development Bank project in 2014 to study the parking problem in Beijing. When we were doing the site invest, we noticed the parking space were full on the ground. If you can see the picture, the parking, if you, can, if you see the picture, the parking is everywhere. Uh, it, the vehicles are on the sidewalk and um, it's on the road even. But if you see the underground parking space, there is no any it's not a lot of vehicles parked. So uh, why this will happen? Why the vehicles are on everywhere on the street? This is uh, back to 2004. One policy called a one parking space for one vehicle was integrated in Beijing. Before 2011, uh, the way Beijing trying to solve the parking problem is basically adding parking supplies, which is adding on street parking supply. And um, then we found when we're doing the project, uh, we think the government somehow uh, lacked the exper experience of a parking management and uh, 
they didn't expect expect the vehicle ownership would be growing expect exponentially. With the uh, in uh, those are all encourage people to drive and park policy. The and the back all the way to 2011, the vehicle ownership was a significant can grow from 1.1 million in 2004 to 3.56 million in 2011. And, but the parking supply was only 2.46 million. Uh, the gap still increasing. Um, so of course the parking or, or more vehicle brings the air condition very low and haze. During the ADB Beijing parking invest site investment, um, we can see the parking is already everywhere. It took the sidewalk, it took the bike lane, and uh, people, pedestrians, cyclists, and uh, uh, car drivers has to use only maybe one lane. So we're trying to figure out what's uh, the demand, the actual parking demand is, and uh, we're trying to know the parking characteristic, and uh, we also know building more parking space is never the solution. It always makes the chaotic and the, makes the situation even worse. So, um, we um, studied several areas, and uh, in this picture, we showed the Lanqing Guoji area is one of them. Um, the area contains one shopping mall, one office building, and uh, over 15, 30 storey residential buildings. Um, as you can see, the on-street parking is already uh, very chaotic. The vehicles is on the sidewalk. And um, if you look at the shopping mall underground parking, um, there is literally no um, park vehicles on the first, second basement. And the third basement is even closed. And if we moved all the um, on street parkings, illegal on street parkings to the underground, it will still full, it will still have enough space. So what was wrong with the parkings? Uh, why is it so chaotic? We looked for the answers for se from several aspects. So first we look at the current parking standards for new developments. And we think the number uh, is very reasonable. Then we look at the parking price, price zone and the parking fee. And um, we think it all, for the Beijing, it already has a very um, clear parking price for each zones, and the zones are very reason reasonable. 
Um, then we look at the regulation of the sec sen sectors. We think it's very confused because four sectors are not subordinate, which causes each sector's authority will affect another. We thought the problem may come from uh, each sector and their informants. So we try to find out the evidence. So several um, evidence we think we find out um, on on-street parkings was not enforced first. The on-street parking fee collectors allowed drivers to pay monthly fee instead of uh, what was said on the regulation, which is hourly fee. And the monthly fee is uh, 240 R RMB each month, which is much cheaper if they pay hourly pay by a month. Uh, Fee collectors also didn't have an informant's authority. So if they say any illegal parking vehicles, they couldn't do anything. Just like what the picture, uh, the left up, upper picture showed up. There is, a, you can say there is an illegal parkings, but you can't uh, do any, they can't do anything without it. Um, then we say, we find out there are too many park, on street parkings, drivers didn't, you, uh, use the underground parking very often. On the left, the bottom picture showed up. We can see the guidance signage has a plenty for vac vacant parking space on underground parkings, but uh, the on-street parking is already full. And um, because there's no informant, even if there is no on-street parking space, the vehicle can still park on as a bike lane or sidewalk just as the last figure showed in uh, Beijing CBD areas. So in uh, March 2015, we submitted our parking guidebook to Beijing Transportation Bernou and the uh, um, Asian Development Bank uh, with uh, gives them suggestions from several aspects like institution charge, on-street parking reform, maxima parking standards, parking zones, parking price, and the parking enforcement. So when we looked back to the official data and the, the parking system, we can say um, our current uh, the current Beijing parking reform is similar to what IDP suggested in 2015. Um, in July 2015, which is just a two months we submitted our report, the Beijing traffic police decided to forbid illegal on strip and the setback parkings on um, uh, 130 streets and the roads and the implement a smart on-street parking space for convenient uh, enforcement. So, um, the, but the drivers are very smart enough to notice the parking space on street parking space, like the cameras, and then nobody is gonna take a collect the fee. So once they just move to the other side of the street, um, they, they will not be charged. So the traffic police uh, implemented more restricted rule. Um, every for every street, one uh, supervisor would ride a e bike with a camera from every form F every 15 minutes to see which cars are in legal parking and they can uh, take the picture and uh, penalize them. After the, the help from the su supervisor, 
the on-street parking finally back to normal, which is provide short-term parking, a uh, short-term parking to drivers. The average parking hours now are uh, le less than two hours. And the, the smart parking system from 2000, 19 to now, there are over uh, 77,000 smart parking space are set. And also Beijing update their parking requirements standards. Uh, for non-resident building, uh, they implemented uh, a new um, parking standards for auto over par public buildings in this May. Uh, the standard even has a more restricted maximum parking space for city center, which on the picture is uh, zone one and zone two. And the, for zone four, there's only uh, minimized the uh, parking space. So in 2018, the Beijing Motor Vehicle Parking Regulation stimulate the Beijing Transportation Banu shall integrate the parking management, which means other three sectors, uh, public security Banu and uh, Beijing Municipal Development and Reform Commission shall assist in, uh, transportation Banu to manage all the parking systems. Um, either on off street parking and on street parking. And it, the change of the institute is the precondition that the on street parking can be enforced very well in 2019. So because Beijing or any other Chinese cities, they start uh, less parking management than the um, entire world, but because, uh, but based on what they learned from the uh, best practice globally and the on-street parking and off-street parking management will be better. That'll be all the report. Thank you for everyone. Great. Thank you so much, Xiao Kun, and thank you, um, our interpreter, Kang Gao, for doing a great job. Um, so we don't have much time for Q&A, but I quickly wanted to remind uh, everyone that they now be uh, picking up questions from the Q&A list and distributing among the panelists. So I'll hand it back to you, um, Dana. Thank you. Great, thanks, Ivana, and thanks, Shakun and Santiago, for two really great and interesting presentations from uh, Mexico City and Beijing. Um, so there's a good question, I think, to start things off, which is, what is the relationship between on and off street parking, and should they be planned together? Um, maybe start with Santi and then go to Shakun. Thanks, Ivana. I think that's a great question. Um, when Thinking about parking, uh, we need to take into account that when someone is deciding to take a trip, they're considering all the demand that's available at a given space. So they're give, thinking about the space that's available off street, but also on street. So if we don't regulate both, um, the benefits uh, perhaps will not materialize. We really need to think about what's also happening on the street. Uh, and those a step that we took in Mexico City before we delved into um, working with off-street parking minimums. We need to have a strategy to also, as Dana was mentioning, to charge um, or to regulate uh, parking on the streets. So it's not that, the, the, that it's one or the other, it's that we need to actually think about um, those two types of parking at the same time. Shaokun, anything to add? For on-street parking, we 
think this should be for short term and the answer should be long term. And we think that um, uh, we have to separate them like um, based on the time to parking time duration. So we can have a, a better arrangement for both of them. Right, I think that's a good point to think about um, different types of trips and different needs for, um, for vehicle storage. Um, and I think maybe Santi mentioned this, but thinking about, um, you know, if you're just regulating on street parking, then you may have an overflow um, for people then choosing off street or vice versa. And we saw those images from Shalkun's presentation where, um, you know, off street parking was essentially empty. Um, because there was so much demand for on-street parking. So um, it really does uh, make sense to regulate these um, and manage uh, on and off-street parking together. Um, we, don't, we don't always see that happen, though. So it's definitely something um, you know, we, we're, we're pushing for and moving towards um, in, in the cities where ITDP is working. Um, great. OK, so next question. Um, is uh, thinking about, uh, it, it would be good to hear from, from both of you how cities in both Mexico and China are using revenues from parking. Um, I know there's, there's the uh, mobility fund in Mexico City, um, but how are those revenues being used? And do we have a sense of um, the amounts of, of revenue that's being generated from uh, either on street parking or those off-street um, development funds? Um, sure, I, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, specifically in the case of Mexico City, we have a very good sense of the amount that is generated uh, by on-street parking. That's, um, that goes through a very transparent system. But we found out through this research that there are no uh, public numbers on how much money is going into this fund and how it is being spent. And that's why we found that it was a worrying, uh, a worrying element of this reform that we need to, to go back and reconsider and that we're trying to, to work on this year. Uh, because it's not only um, you know, doing a reform or setting up a fund or a charging system, it's also that we need to, to do so in a very transparent way and really to put information uh, where everybody can access it. And, and completely, and just to be completely honest, is that something that we still need to work, to work on in Mexico? And we are a bit worried, and we're we're actually trying to fight to to learn how much money is on this fund and how is it being used? Because right now we really don't have a sense of that. And. 嗯，在中国的话，就是所谓的一个停车收费、路内停车收费的话，都是属于直接上交到财政，就是我们不太清楚它具体用于哪里。但是因为政府是对公共，你叫 uh, on street parking, um, price fee will be hand to the treasurer Bernou directly once we collect all of them annually. Um, but uh, the every city in China, uh, didn't. Uh, provides the official number of what uh, uh, how many they have collected, but and but um, for the public um, transport like bus and metro, and uh, um, some public facilities like a uh, bicycle uh, dock station, there were uh, some some cities that they use uh, parking fee to uh, pay in those parks. Great, and since we only have a couple minutes left, I'm just, I think this will maybe be our, our final question. I think this is actually a good um, segue to our, our third and final um, Taming Traffic webinar. Um, but we have a question about the relationship between um, parking policies and uh, emerging low emission zones. So I know um, Mexico City is, is looking uh, at implementing a low emission zone and Chakun, you've been working um, in Jinan on a low emission zone as well. How, how does parking factor into um, the design and implementation of, of low emission zones in your cities? Um, 
That's a great question, Dana. Uh, I think that uh, parking is a key component of low emission zones, right? Because as we learned throughout your presentation, and um, also what I presented, uh, availability of parking spaces really just attracts car use. Uh, so thinking about uh, how we're helping people shift their modes into more sustainable ones, we need to um, really uh, consider the amount of parking that is being provided in that zone very seriously and really try to reduce it as much as possible to avoid uh, actually attracting um, excessive car use. So it, it, it needs to be a, a key component in a, you know, in a specific area that's trying to, to help people shift their modes into more sustainable ones. And as, again, we need to think about both what's happening on street, but also how we're building uh, the new constructions on, on this area and try to know what uh, contribute to, uh, again, an oversupply of parking and making it too easy and, and, and cheap to drive. So we think um, the LEZ low emission zone and the parking are somehow related and uh, very pos um, positive. So if we need to build a low emission zone, we want to uh, decrease the travel by cars and we want to prove, uh, encourage um, more people to use public transit or, or uh, use a bike or e-bikes if we build more parkings either on street or off street we will uh, uh, occupy the most public space in the low emission zone So we want to um, not build the parking garages or any kind of parking facilities in the low emission zone. And instead of that, we will um, build more public uh, facilities like um, a square or some um, uh, children palace where children can play and to and keep them safe in the low emission zone. Great. Well, thanks again to you both for uh, presenting and uh, answering a couple of questions. We had a lot of great questions come in um, and maybe we'll follow up on those um, uh, as, as follow up to the webinar, but I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Ivana to close us out. Great. Thank you so much, Dana. And thank you again to presenters and thank you to our um, attendees as well for joining um, the webinar today. Unfortunately, we approached the end of our session. As mentioned earlier, the webinar recording and PowerPoints will be available on ITDP's website and our YouTube channel as well. In the meantime, please visit ITDP.org to check out the latest ITDP resources and the Transport Matters blog post uh, space. Um, also do follow us on social media and stay in the loop for the exciting, very, very exciting forthcoming online events. Thank you again, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye.